All right, welcome to Classical Greece Part 2. We're going to talk about the political and economic developments that they came up with, major cultural contributions, the end of city-state independence under Macedonian rule, but really think about this as like timelines and maps, timelines and maps, and also cool stuff. Um, so here's the goal for the overview reminder. The terms in yellow, those are your friends. Most important to know those things. It is your key to the entire experience. And anytime I take a, a moment aside to explain some stuff, like Herodotus over here, who is the father of histories, a guy who wrote a book about the Persian Wars, which we'll talk about. And look, it even says the name right there. Important guy to know. Here's a geographical timeline. Clearly there's no geography on here yet, but we're going to look at the maps in just a minute. But here are the big things we're about to talk about. The Persian Wars, the Golden Age of Pericles, which kind of spreads out longer than this, but it really gets interrupted by the Peloponnesian War, and then the rise of the Macedonian kings, who then conquer Greece and then go on to conquer a lot of other stuff, and as a result spread Greek things around the world, uh, Hellenizing. Uh, that is a term that Greeks use for themselves, and so we say like they Hellenized the rest of the world. So you can see here an example of the Battle of uh, Salamis. This is during the Persian Wars. You can see Pericles with a good quote right there. You can take a pause, read that guy. There's a, this is the work of Thucydides, another historian we're going to talk about, and uh, the book that he wrote about the Peloponnesian War. And then here's a picture of Alexander the Great, one of those Macedonian kings that we'll talk more about. So first of all, let's talk about Persia. So before the Persian Wars got started here, Persia was already this massive empire who had that royal road that ran all the way along it. It was rather well organized uh, for being such a huge empire. And it covered almost all of the territory that we had talked about before with like Egypt, the Mesopotamian kingdoms, even over here into India, taking parts of the Indus River Valley at certain uh, times of its existence. And so here's Greece over here. And in particular, there's Athens. Uh, so you can see the difference in size. For sure. So the Persian Wars got started when Athens supported a revolt of the Greek cities that were over here on Asia Minor, which were technically under Persian control. They tried to revolt, which means they tried to break away from the Persian Empire, and the Athenians were like, yeah, sounds good, and showed up with ships and spears. And Persia, they burned down a major city, uh, and as a result, Persia got uh, real salty, and they decided to enact some campaigns, you know, trying to take over Greece, trying to, you know, get some revenge against Athens. And they did end up needing to go through this twice. So they, the first time, uh, came through and were rather unsuccessful. Uh, and they came back a second time, and that's the one we're going to focus a little bit more on the second time around as they came in through here. But Athens is really the key to defeating them both times. And it's part of what propelled Athens to its level of fame and power. Uh, so Athenian victories at two battles in the second wave of the Persian invasion uh, over here at Marathon and Salamis. Those were two key uh, locations of victories. And Marathon is on land, land battle. And Salamis is the water conflict, the uh, naval battle that you can see in the little pop-out map down here. And that was where all of that planning around creating ships really paid off because they were able to destroy the Persian ships as they were coming in, and uh, that prevented them from resupplying and continuing their campaign, and in a lot of ways that prevented Persia from just dominating Greece. And you can see that some Greek states stayed uh, neutral, but Sparta and Athens were allied in that war. They were allied with each other. So after that Persian War, Athens, which previously had been kind of like not a nobody, but certainly not a big deal in uh, Greece compared to Sparta, uh, they used their newfound naval power and the fact that they had beaten uh, Persia back to create this network of connected cities and city-states, all these Greek settlements all along the coast there. And that was called the Delian League, named after Delos, the island that's right here in the Aegean Sea, because that's where they kept the money that everybody paid in. So they said, ostensibly, like, we want to keep the Persians out. So everybody in this area, let's all work together to keep them out. So you can either contribute money or you can contribute ships. And all the other Greek city-states were like, ships are hard to make. I'm just going to give you money. And the Athenians were like, cool, we'll definitely use those for ships. And they didn't. They also used it to build a lot of big uh, temples and other things. But they did use it for ships. And uh, so they, they built back the Parthenon, which is a big, beautiful temple in the center of Athens. 
And this period of time where with all these cities contributing and Athens creating this massive maritime empire, because over time it became clear it wasn't like all of these cities are equal to each other. It's like Athens isn't just like the big brother city. It's like Athens is actually maybe creating an empire and requiring people to join and you can't leave even if you want to. That was the vibe that ended up happening. And so in part caused by Athens, uh, you know, taking over all these places, starting to be more and more like an empire, and also because they just kept making Sparta mad and doing things to disrupt Sparta's sphere of influence, uh, making Sparta feel threatened by Athenian expansion, uh, they ended up in a war with each other. And Sparta organized all of the people who were mad at Athens to another league called the Peloponnesian League, named after the, the uh, peninsula that they're down over here. And the result of this was that you know, Athens and Sparta were both weakened. But these these moments in time, this this uh, Persian Wars and then also the Peloponnesian Wars were so earth-shaking for the Greeks, such huge momentous occasions, that it started the, the entire field of history because people were writing about it, particularly folks we'll talk about in a minute. But you can see this war took place all across the Aegean Sea, the Ionian Sea, out even into uh, the Mediterranean Sea. It wasn't just located here. In fact, the majority of it took place in areas other than Athens and Sparta. It took place all over. And the thing was that this, because it weakened the two sort of superpowers of the Greek world there, uh, it allowed a new upstart kingdom called Macedonia, first under uh, Philip II of Macedonia, and then under his son, Alexander the Great, to take over all of Greece, including eventually Sparta. This is a map of Greece under the rule of Philip II. That was uh, Alexander's father. And then Alexander managed to like get it all under his control. And Alexander didn't just conquer this area, as you'll see in a second. He conquered a whole lot. Uh, his conquests stretched all the way to what we call the Near East, which means kind of a big, awkward area, which I'll show you right now. That's the Near East? Anyway, Alexander conquered the whole thing. And in doing so, and then setting up the little kingdoms that came after Alexander died, uh, it spread all these Greek ideas that had taken time to really boil and get you know great in Athens and Sparta, particularly in Athens, spread those ideas out around this whole area and became incredibly influential on all the kingdoms and empires that came after them. And you can see Alexander the Great. What's worth knowing about him is he's like a military genius uh, and also uh, believed he was a god and had a lot of other feelings about how the world should be um, and named a lot of cities after himself. Uh, it's not showing you here, but there's a truly enormous number of places called Alexandria as a result of him conquering stuff and creating cities. So after he dies, though, there's no one capable of keeping all that whole area that he conquered together. So not only did he take over Persia, he also managed to shatter it into a bunch of different little pieces. And so there are all these, what we call the successor kingdoms, the people who came after. And there's the Ptolemies, there's uh, Seleucus or Seleucid uh, empire that's right over here. There's Parthia, there's the Greco-Bactrian kingdom, which is really important because it inspires the Mauryan empire to get started. Uh, but they were all, they all contained Greek culture. And so again, it was the culture, not just a single Greek empire, but Greek culture that spread around the world as a result of this. We say they were Hellenized, meaning Hellenic culture, Greek culture was spread around the world. So as a result, we have a lot of the cultural artifacts, ideas, writings, stuff from this time period. And here's what we're going to be learning about for the rest of the video is basically What's the important stuff? What are the big names and people that you gotta gotta know about that? So you gotta know about the drama, not like the drama, but like the drama, like the the plays. The 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 Greeks practically invented the, what we think of as drama, and you know Aeschylus and Sophocles were both really important uh, dramatic writers. But you know during the golden age of Athens, they were known for their heart wrenching tragedies, which is not my cup of tea, but like it could be somebody's cup of tea. You can see the Greek theater masks because. We didn't have microphones, and so and it was hard to do. Uh, you could, didn't have a video close up on somebody, so seeing the mask for our waitlist, you know exactly who it's supposed to be. Uh, and you also have poetry from this time period, as Greeks are establishing their identity from a prop, maybe historical person called Homer, maybe just a mythical person who composed these really important 
uh, poems. And when I say poem, I mean <laughs> they're not short. It's not a it's not a limerick. It's an epic poem. They take a very long time to read. The Iliad was the story of the Trojan War, uh, and then the Odyssey is kind of like part two of the Iliad. And it's Odysseus who was one of the major leaders of the Greeks. Uh, Basically, the stories that he told his wife to explain why it took him so long to get home from the war. Um, and it's pretty fascinating. Lots of really good mythology in there. Monsters and traveling on water. And, you know, it's an adventure story. So war story, adventure story, that's the Greek vibe. Uh, so terrible things happening to people. War stories and adventure stories. Welcome to Greece. So uh, there was also a you know flowering of the visual arts like sculpture and Phidias is our example here created uh, really beautiful idealized detailed lifelike statues you can see a statue a reconstruction of a statue of Zeus massive look how massive that is and uh, here's a picture of Homer doing doing his poet thing a little bit of music accompanying it um, and then also during this time period is the creation of history, which, you know, I'm excited about. So uh, they basically invented this idea of collecting accounts and weaving together all these different accounts from different people into a single story, a narrative of what happened. And Herodotus uh, wrote a history of the Persian Wars, and then Thucydides wrote a history of the Peloponnesian Wars. And largely, that's why we know what happened during these things, because these texts have actually come down to us as like available to us. And we also learn some from these texts, but also from other uh, texts that we have available, the philosophy, like what people were thinking about at the time and how they thought the world worked and how they, why they thought the world existed in the first place. So we have some key philosophers that are worth knowing. We've got Socrates, the oldest of the group who questioned everything and was really infuriating to be around in fact, so infuriating to be around that uh, Athens voted that he should have to kill himself with uh, by drinking poison. So that's a, a, a vibe check on that guy. Uh, Plato was Socrates' pupil who wrote stuff down, <laughs> fortunately, because Socrates was uh, not writing stuff down. And Plato kind of used Socrates as like, as like a character, but through that we know a lot of both what Plato was thinking and probably what Socrates thought and said and did. Um, and we have other sources attesting to Socrates' existence. Uh, and then we have Aristotle, who came after Plato and is seen as the father of natural philosophy, which later would grow into a thing called science. And he collected massive heaps of knowledge and specimens of things and then organized it all incredibly obsessively and was so extensive in his work and wrote about everything enough that basically he became the world's source for information on everything for a really long time. It's also worth knowing some of these other things that they left behind. Uh, there was really beautiful architecture. Here's some interesting different kinds of columns. Now, when I was first looking at this class, I'm like, why are we learning about the different kinds of columns? That seems like a waste of time. How specific? But now I understand this better. So this, th if you look at these columns, you understand a sense of like, what it was like to live in different places. So take a look at the uh, Ionic columns here and the Corinthian columns. Look how like ornate and like fascinating and beautiful they are, all right? That's, you know, Athens, Ionic, and then Corinthians, like the, the town of Corinth. And then Doric, this is the Spartans. Look how basic that is, right? The Spartans uh, were basically just concerned with warfare and everything else seemed superfluous to them. Everything else seemed like, why are we even gonna do it? So anyway, their columns, Again, really tells you their vibe. Now, in the world of science, you have some major inventors. Uh, so this is Archimedes' uh, screw pump. You draw water up this way just by turning a handle like that. It's really efficient and good. And so there were lots of different inventions being created during this time. And then also uh, Hippocrates started what we think of as modern medicine through his writing. If you've heard of the Hippocratic Oath, this is where that comes from. And so Hipp uh, Hippocrates was one of those people who is referenced in lots of later texts and people still write about today. And in the world of mathematics, you might also have heard of some things called the Pythagorean Theorem over here, illustrated where you can know the, if you know two of the sides of a triangle, you can actually learn what the third side is. And uh, we can talk more about that later, but also you have uh, Euclid who wrote about the geometry of regular solid shapes, which is really fascinating. And, and they saw mathematics as 
inherently connected to a deeper understanding of the universe, like that everything was math, which is a fascinating idea. Not all of them, but uh, fascinating that these ideas come up during these, this time, and we are still talking about them. So that's what's worth knowing about this time period in Greece. I hope you've enjoyed it because we're going to talk a lot more about it. Music